Hello and a very good evening. It's one minute past eight on LBC. Welcome to Cross Question, LBC's thrice weekly political panel debate show. Joining me on the panel today are Jason Cowley, Editor-in-Chief of the New Statesman, Lord Peter Lilly, Conservative peer, former Cabinet Minister under Margaret Thatcher and John Major, Emma Hardy is Labour MP for Kingston upon, upon Hull West and Hessel, former Shadow Universities Minister, and Dominic Samuels, political commentator who I spy has been on the Red Bull this evening, so she's going to give us a bit of entertainment. I, I, I think. Uh, right, we are going to get on with your first question in a moment, but let me just remind you that you can watch us on Global Player, on lbc.co.uk, on the LBC Facebook page and Twitter feed. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Let's go to Paul in Aldershot. Hello, Paul. What would you like to ask? Uh, good evening. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, is it fair that Cressida Dick receives, receives so much criticism given the fact that the size of the organisation and the workload that, that, uh, that she faces is absolutely enormous? Um, probably... Broadly, we seem to have lost Paul. Right, um, Peter Lilly, um, what, what, what's your view on this? Well, I haven't read the report uh, since it came out. Uh, it seems odd that she should uh, a be subject to criticism about something that happened 34 years ago, and b be apparently being less than helpful about opening up on what happened 34 years ago. Uh, it's a strange thing that people in all sorts of organisations put the reputation of their organisation at risk in trying to defend it. And it appears that that was what she's done. Uh, but uh, as I say, I've only got that second hand from the report. <laughs> Others may be better informed, in which case they may or may not correct me. But I wouldn't. Uh, I, I think she should be questioned as to why she's behaved like this, but she does attract a certain amount of flack and it's easy to jump on and say, oh, she should resign over this, that and the other. Um, she should be subject to criticism. She should answer for herself. Uh, but I'm puzzled as to why she apparently put the reputation of her organisation at risk by trying to defend it by being too defensive. What about the broader question of the workload of managing an organisation as big as the Metropolitan uh, Police? Um, inevitably, I mean, the buck stops with her. She is at the top of it. Um, but she can't be held responsible for the actions of one or two errant officers, I suppose. Well, uh, if she's in charge of an organisation, she should be, and I'm sure she is, big enough to cope with those problems. Uh, of course, um, she isn't responsible for everything that everyone did, did still less what they did 34 years ago. I was responsible for 100,000 people at the DSS uh, and it was held accountable in Parliament, even if, you know, one of them uh, failed to give the correct benefits to someone. But uh, you have to learn to cope with that. I, I, so I don't think that's an excuse she could rely on. That it, oh, it's all too big for me to cope with. It's too big for her to cope with. She shouldn't be there. Uh, I think she probably has got the capacity to cope with it. But I don't understand why she was less than helpful to this inquiry. Emma Hardy. Well, I think I kind of agree with, with Peter in the point that you have to hold somebody responsible and she is in charge of the Met. But I do, and, and like Peter, I kind of find it slightly confusing that she wouldn't want to be as open and as transparent and as helpful as possible because no one could hold her responsibility responsible for something that happened so many years ago. And therefore, you'd assume that she'd want to seem to be going over and above in terms of helping the inquiry. But from in terms of the report, I haven't read all of the report, but the brief look I had at it 
may, I think the concern we should be thinking about now is what are we going to do differently going forward? I think sometimes we can spend a lot of time looking at mistakes in the past and we miss out the important part of how are we going to learn from this and what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to change? So I suppose the questions that I'd be wanting uh, the government to answer right now is how can we ensure that the Met follow all of the recommendations that are in this report? How can we look at the change to make sure that these mistakes aren't repeated? We have a a case in Humberside Police, uh, of, uh, which you know I won't go into now, but when we're looking at investigating historical cases, I think we do need to look at how they're done and making sure all the evidence is available at all times. And, and I think that's where we should be focusing at the moment. Um, Dominic Samuels, what, what, what's your view on this? And, and I mean, looking at the Daniel Morgan case in particular, it, it, can Cressida Dick be the right person to implement the recommendations of this report when she's criticised in it? Well, I haven't um, actually read it, so I think I would generally agree. Um, when you're the face of something as big as the Met, it makes sense for you to be generally held responsible for the things that go wrong. Um, but then at the same time, I would have a bit of sympathy in the sense that, you know, she obviously cannot be responsible for every single person that does something wrong. And in a sense, I feel that she's kind of an easy target at the moment. I mean, she had um, a lot of criticism, what with the Sarah Everard vigil and how that was policed. And I think at the moment she is facing a lot of criticism. So I'm not entirely surprised that she is mentioned in this report. But then again, um, I think it should be her responsibility to hold herself accountable and do what she can to um, make progress with the um, actual recommendations. Um, Jason Cowley, when you look at the fact that, what, 20 years ago or so, the, the Met Police were accused of being institutionally racist, they're now accused of being institutionally corrupt, um, it's a pretty sad state of affairs for an organisation to be in. It, it is, it is Ian. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, when you, when you lead a, an organisation as complex and as important as the Metropolitan Police, ultimately, as the leader, you, you are responsible um, and then you have to use your judgment even in historical investigations. Now, this, this case goes back a long time. I'm old enough to vaguely remember it was the murder of a private detective, I think. A brutal murder and then a long, slow investigation. And I don't think they ever got to the bottom of it. And I think that along the way, the Met was seen to delay and withhold access to the, for, the, for the investigation. So it's very tough. You're right, though. It was denounced after the investigations into the terrible Stephen Lawrence murder and the McPherson report. It was concluded that the Met was institutionally racist. This is at the end of the 90s. Now it's been called institutionally corrupt. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's challenging for Cressida Dick. When you lead an organisation, if you remember George Antwerp whistle at the BBC um, in 2012, during the terrible Savile, um, crisis, and then the false allegations that were made by BBC Newsnight against Lord McAlpine. George, George M. Whistle, the Director General of the BBC, although he himself wasn't culpable, he, he resigned from his role as Director General of the BBC. And often when you lead a public-facing organisation and your organisation is seen to have failed in some way, some critical way, often the leader of that um, organisation, if that leader has um, decency, and dignity and a sense of um, a belief in the common good, you resign. Now, I'm not sure what, what today's conclusion is a resigning issue for Cressida Dick, but it's very serious. It comes after the terrible murder uh, of the young woman who was travelling home from Clapham Common. I don't know, I don't need to go into the details of that case because of contempt of court, but, but we all know broadly what happened. We know what happened when Many women turned up to rally that night um, in support of the victim. And I would suggest that Cressida Dick is um, going through a very, very difficult period. Let's, um, Paul, let's come back to you for a quick view of, uh, from, from you. You asked the question about whether she, it's fair that she receives so much criticism. You clearly have some sympathy with her. Yeah, I, I think I do, because I think, you know, that she doesn't seem to get any support from um, A, B and the Mayor, um, who is supposed to oversee the organisation anyway. Um, given the, the size of that organisation, then she sits at the top and anything that comes, you know, from, from one way or another, 
she seems to face face the flat over. And I do think there's a lot of other people that are ducking out of this. And, you know, she, she's, she's carrying the can for. As Jason points out, though, Paul, it's the same in any big organisation or even small organisation. If, if you are the person at the top, uh, you are answerable for the actions of the entire organisation. And sometimes uh, you have to take the consequences of that. Paul, thank you very much indeed. There's an allied question here on a text from Jackie in Hastings, who says this. BBC journalist Nick Watt had to flee from anti-lockdown protesters yesterday. Police can be seen on the video very clearly, but the Met are now claiming there was no one in the vicinity. Should those involved be prosecuted and should there be a police inquiry? Well I've seen that video and it is quite clear there were lots of police around who did not intervene, I'm not sure they were asked to intervene um, Dominic Samuels and what, what do you think about this? Should there be an inquiry? Should people be prosecuted for chasing after a BBC journalist? I mean if that constitutes harassment or threatening behaviour then you know of course and I think it was clear from the video that he was being chased um, and he was being treated very aggressively and the police weren't really doing anything. Um, I think you have to kind of look at whether or not they were really aware of what was actually going on. Did they know he was a journalist? Did you know they know that he was in distress or asking for help? Um, I think there was obviously a lag with that um, from seeing the video. Um, but I think my issue would be is that some people um, on social media, particularly unsurprisingly, using you know that video as an excuse to tarnish the reputation of anti-lockdown protesters. And obviously I do not condone the video, but that video doesn't represent you know the majority of people who are anti-lockdown. And I think if anything, that video, which is obviously not a good look, does represent that there is a growing uh, frustration in this country with the persistence um, of lockdown measures. <laughs> But it's the same on any protest, isn't it? There'll be a few people, it's like the Black Lives Matter protest last June, where the overwhelming number of people were peaceful, but at the end of it, there was um, violence. Now, there wasn't actual violence here. I think there were certainly threats, or Nick Watts certainly felt un under threat. Um, Peter Lilly, I, I imagine in your life in politics, you've had one or two incidents where you felt fairly unsafe um, at the hands of protesters. Um, yes, actually. Uh, I remember finding my way through a crowd of about 3,000 people demonstrating during the miners' strike outside the Conservative Party conference. And when I was hoping I wouldn't be noticed, one did notice me, and I was foolish enough to stop and engage in argument. Then I felt my wife uh, thumping me on the back and trying to get me out of it. And I said, all right, darling, I'll be with you in a minute looked around and found it, it was actually one of the demonstrators thumping me on the back with his placard. Uh, but he was, <laughs> so it's a lot about your wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, she is a strong-willed woman. <laughs> but uh, he was so shocked by being called darling by me that he desisted. I was able to get out of the crowd. I'd be very lucky. I haven't suffered. I, I've suffered threats, but I've never suffered physical abuse beyond that. Have you, have you seen this video? No, I haven't. Uh, but uh, I, my, you know, normally I wouldn't be sympathetic to anybody on Newsnight. But the one person on Newsnight I'm sympathetic with, even if he's only being shouted at from a distance, is Nick Watt, who's <laughs> the best thing on Newsnight. Um, Jason Cowley, obviously, as a, as a journalist, you'll, you'll have a lot of sympathy with Nick Watt here. But frankly, it doesn't matter whether he's a journalist or indeed any anybody else. This should not happen, should it? I absolutely agree. Um, I've seen the video. Um, it was very menacing. Very disturbing, actually. No one actually punches him. One guy sort of jostles him. You can see that Nick is deeply alarmed. Police are quite close by, actually. Um, no, no attempt to intervene. Obviously, one one supports the right to, to peaceful protest. What I what I take from it though is something slightly different from an attempt to tarnish um, anti-lockdown protesters. It deep. What worries me increasingly is the attack on um, journalists going about their um, business. Um, and Nick is a, is a reporter. He's not a commentator. You know, he's a political editor. He's an independent reporter. He's, he's his own politics. I, I couldn't predict what they were. Um, he's he's sceptical in his reproach. He asks difficult questions. And he's a reporter. He's trying to find the truth and explain it and tell stories about what's going on. Now, increasingly, they're not, not necessarily in this country, but, but in this country, but also beyond these shores, journalists are under threat. 
they're being menaced by state power, by other, by other institutions. You know, I, I went to Romania with Jeremy Hunt when he was foreign secretary to report on a trip. And one of Jeremy's particular interests was press freedom. And we, I was at, I was at a round, round table of Romanian journalists. And Romania's in the EU, um, at which we listened to their stories of how the state, you know, former communist country, but now nominally a democracy or, or a democracy, is putting increasing pressure on journalists, stopping them doing their job, um, stopping them going about their business, stopping them reporting freely. And this is a deeply disturbing trend. And not so long ago, we had the president of the United States, who was determined, in effect, to declare war on mainstream publications. You know, the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, um, CNN. You know, he dismissed them as fake news because he didn't, he didn't like what they were reporting and what they were saying. And what we saw happen to Nick today is part of that hostile culture directed at journalists. And I don't care what their politics are, right, left, centrist, Remainers, Brexiteers. What I don't like is seeing reporters going about their business being menaced in the way that Nick Watt today was menaced or yesterday, and the police okay. simply standing by observing. Um, Dominic, you you were laughing and shaking your head at what Jason was saying about Donald Trump there. Um, it's surely an incontrovertible fact that he did make things very difficult for legitimate journalists. Unequivocally true. I mean, at the same time, he was always being questioned by journalists. The same can't actually be said for Joe Biden, who regularly won't go near journalists. And secondly... In terms of, you know, the whole thing about fake news, yes, I understand that there was, you know, kind of a cultivation of hostility towards journalists. But I think it's also an indisputable fact that in America, platforms like CNN and the New York Post were just objectively biased against Donald Trump. You do not see the same level of critique towards Joe Biden that you did towards um, Donald Trump. I think even the New York Post took down their uh, their fact-checking section that was, was reserved for Donald Trump, and now it's mysteriously disappeared. Now Joe Biden is president. So I think there are two sides well, to this. Maybe it's because he just doesn't lie like Donald Trump did. Oh, come on. Joe Biden doesn't lie like Donald Trump did. I mean, all politicians, you know, play with the truth and lie about things. And if you really are about objective fact checking, then you wouldn't remove it just because someone you like is president. That's not objective journalism. You surely can't be comfortable to see a, you can't, surely can't be comfortable to see um, a journalist going about his business being menaced in the way that Nick was, surely. Well, no, I, I mean, I've said multiple times that I don't think it was the right thing to do, but I think... Where I'm coming from is I do think that a lot of people are frustrated with a growing level of bias that seems to be um, within the media at the moment, which is why there's such an appetite for platforms. There's always, but there's always bias in media. Mm. Um, if you're if you're free press, you you have different yeah. political points of view and you argue them in a free and fair way. That's what happens in democracies. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what democracy is yeah. about. Yeah. No one's arguing for fixed opinions. No, I'm, bias, I'm, or, 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 I'm not anti-bias. Bias is fine by me. No, I would completely agree with that. But the overwhelming direction of that opinion seems to be towards the left. And I just have to be honest about that. And what, that's what, what opinion are you talking about that's towards the left? So that's, can I just finish, please? That's why there's such an appetite for platforms like GB News, who surpassed uh, the BBC in viewing figures um, recently. That's why there's such an appetite for it. I'm not saying that that warrants hostility and violence towards journalists. But you can't pretend that, you know, you don't understand why people are getting sick of journalists. I think oh, what I you do. meant to no, say no, was I, there's, I, such, there's such an appetite for RBC, I'm, I'm, but... Yeah. Uh, I'm going to defend. <laughs> I'm um, going to defend. Uh, uh, okay, I'm Emma to, Hardy. I journalists of whatever political position they are. I, 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 I defend the free press. Emma. Well, you know, obviously, I've seen the video of Nick Watt. I put something out on Twitter about it. I thought it was absolutely appalling. I think it's fantastic in our country that we have the right to free speech, we have the right to protest, but those rights carry with them a level of responsibility and the right to. You know, there's no right to intimidate, to bully, to be aggressive. And and in fact, I say this, and I've said this not just as a politician, but as a primary teacher for the 11 years beforehand. It is perfectly possible to disagree without being disagreeable. 
well. And since becoming a member of parliament and formed the Oversee All Party Parliamentary Group with that sole aim, improving the debate and discussion that is had within our education system. Of course, there has always been looking at news as being biased. There's bias all the time. You look at the different newspapers, of course they have a political slant. I mean, it's, it's amusing sometimes, especially when you look at the reaction to the G7, to see each different newspaper take its own political uh, you know, reaction to it. And indeed to GB News, when you look at the reaction from the different Path, uh, from the different papers that are out there and how they wrote up the uh, the first night of GB News. But that's fine. That's democracy. That's having different views. That's publishing those different views. That's disagreeing in a way that is a pillar right. of our democracy. We do not need to be in a position where we try and, and, and silence other people. And I do have to say, I find it just a little bit uh, amusing that some of the people who claim to be silenced are those we've seen the most of on our news and publication and through social media recently. So but for being silenced, they do seem to be uh, rather public at the moment. So I think if we're going to talk about how do we debate well as a democracy? How do we disagree in a fair way? How do we act in a respectful manner to each other and show that while we might have different opinions, we respect the fact that somebody else has them and they have a right to give them as well. But I think this idea that, um, I mean, I'd love all the mainstream media to be on the left and giving the Labour Party a really great time. That would be wonderful. I can't wait for that day to happen. But I sincerely promise it is not happening right now. Well, I don't know, you know, at the end of our news hour, um, I, as an impartial news broadcaster, I said to Barry Gardner, I, I obviously can't give an opinion on your fire and rehire campaign, but I fully support it. Now, if I was on the BBC, obviously I'd get sacked for that, but there we go. Um, right, I'm going to call, call this to an end. Um, it's 22 minutes past eight. Do keep your calls coming. 0345 6060 973. This is LBC. Hello. With Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.24 on LBC. We have with us Jason Cowley, Editor-in-Chief of the New Statesman, Lord Lilly, Peter Lilly, Conservative peer and former Cabinet Minister, Emma Hardy, Labour MP for Kingston upon Hull West and Hessel, and former Shadow Universities Minister, and the political commentator Dominique Samuels. Right, let's go to our next question. It's from Claire in Edgware. Hello, Claire. Yeah, good evening, panel. Um, we signed a trade deal with Australia today, and according to the BBC um, uh, One O'Clock News, that contributes... 0.02% to our economy over the next 15 years, which represents about a pound per UK household. And so far, again, according to reports, Brexit has cost us 200 billion. Will we ever, do we have any, ever have any hope of recouping the millions that we've lost 
as a result of Brexit and walking away from a market of 500 million people? Um, Dominic Samuels. <laughs> Do you know, I just find this conversation, you know, really tiresome now. I think we do have to get over the fact that we did leave the European Union. Um, and I think the Australia deal, yes, it, it may be small in terms of the uh, benefits it gives per household. Um, but I do think there are some benefits. Say, for example, um, for younger people, it makes it makes it easier um, for us to go and live um, and work in Australia. It makes, you know, exporting things like Scotch whiskey to Australia easier. Um, and and I think not just on the basis of kind of the material uh, positive that it has, but it does also signal that the UK is able to go out and um, forge trade deals um, with other partners. I mean, we wouldn't have got this kind of deal um, with Australia had we have been um, in the EU. Um, so I think we do have to, you know, kind of be positive about things like this get over the fact that we've moved on and just recognise that we are moving on and forging relationships with other partners across the world. And also the fact that um, with Australia, securing this trade deal will also mean that um, we're able to access other markets further overseas. So there are benefits to this and it will take some time. We were a part of the EU for such a long time. Obviously, it will take time to recover. It's not going to be like a, 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 you know, a two-year thing. Jason. Um, good old Aussies, eh? Our old friends from we play cricket with them, so why not? Why not? Why not have a trade deal? I mean, it's 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 not going to amount to much, but it's a start, isn't it? It's a post it's a post Brexit start, and it's it's symbolic. It's 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 a it's the first trade deal. I'm, you know, I can't get particularly agitated about it either way. I might if I was a, a sheep farmer, mm -hmm. or I farmed cattle in in in, in Scotland. Um, I might get a little bit more worried about um, the arrival of, I mean, what is it? Australia, I think, is the second largest exporter of beef in the world after Brazil. A huge country, huge me mechanised farming practices. You know, I might be more concerned if I was a farmer. But again, I heard your conversation with Barry Gardner, Ian, just before the programme began, and you were talking about 15-year introduction periods. But it's symbolic. Um, we can't refight the Brexit wars. Um, Boris Johnson went into the 2019 um, general election on a manifesto to get Brexit done. Um, the Liberal Democrats had a manifesto to revoke the 2016 referendum result, and they were routed. And indeed, their leader even lost her parliamentary seat. And the Labour Party in 2019 went into that election offering a second referendum and went down to their worst defeat since 1935. I mean, I voted for Remain. I was always a sceptical Remainer, but I voted to remain. Now, I was sorry the United Kingdom left the European Union, but the United Kingdom has left the European Union. That has been an opportunity was taken in 2019 to reverse that decision. The electorate chose not to. Um, where the complications arise for the Brexiteers as they push on into this brave new future of so-called global Britain is the United Kingdom itself. Now, Brexit has a chance of succeeding if the UK holds together. But two constituent parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland and Northern Ireland, voted remain. Um, the union is fragile, probably as fragile as it, I, I've known it. Um, a nationalist movement is in power in Scotland, the SNP, um, won another resounding victory at the Scottish Parliament elections. We've, we, we are already witnessing what Brexit is doing to the stability of Northern Ireland. And you saw behind the scenes at the G7 summit in Cornwall, the tensions between Johnson, um, Ursula von der Leyen of the EU, Macron and, and um, Merkel of Germany. So there are real tensions over that Northern Ireland protocol. So this first trade deal with Australia, it, it's a start. It's symbolic. Brexit, we, it's too early to work out whether Brexit is going to be a successful failure. A lot of people are... Uh, ardent Remainers will always consider it a failure. They, they, won't, they won't want it in any way to succeed because they, they identified as Europeans. They wanted to be part of that European Union. More than half of the population did not, certainly in England. But the real challenges lie ahead is holding the United Kingdom together, I think. OK. Right, we'll get the answers from our two politicians in just a moment. But do keep your calls coming with your questions. 0345 6060 973. It's half past eight on LBC. Sora Suleiman has the news headlines. The Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Dame Cressida Dick, has apologised for failings in an unsolved murder case after an independent report 
not accuse the force of institutional corruption. Private detective Daniel Morgan was killed in 1987 and no one has been convicted despite five police inquiries. The report found major failings which spanned decades. The UK has signed a post-Brexit trade deal with Australia. The agreement should make favourites like Australian wine and Tim Tam biscuits slightly cheaper. However, there's concern from British farmers about imports of cheap meat. And the ex-wife of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has donated $2.7 billion to charity. Mackenzie Scott is one of the world's richest women. The money will be shared among 286 organisations working on racial inequality, the arts and and education. LBC weather rain in western Scotland easing through the night, scattered showers for northwest England and largely dry and clear across the south, a low of 10 degrees. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.33, you're listening to LBC's Cross Question with Jason Cowley, Editor-in-Chief of the New Statesman, Lord Peter Lilly, Conservative Peer, former Cabinet Minister, Emma Hardy, Labour MP for Kingston-upon-Hull West and Hessel, and former Shadow Universities Minister and the political commentator Dominique Samuels. Well, Claire in Edgware asked the question, we just signed a trade deal uh, with Australia that contributes £1 per family. Are we ever going to be able to financially recoup the money we lost by leaving the EU? Emma Hardy. Well, I think Jason's right in that we had a general election which solves or, you know, put to bed the question of Brexit once and for all. And as and as Jason said, if people had wanted another referendum, then we would be the party in government right now and we're not. So I think it is about what do we do next and how well do we do it moving moving forward. And I think the problem with the Australian deal is similar to the promises made during fishing. It's the over-promising, under-delivering. Now, the area I, where I'm from, Hull, has been a proud fishing area and we've just, I've recently been talking about the impact on distant fleet water fishing. They were promised a lot by the Brexit campaign. They were promised a lot by the Conservative government. They were promised the heady days of returning to, you know, the fishing industry that once was. And what we've had instead is the failure to secure a deal with Norway is distant fleet fishing ending for good for England and the last of the distant fleet fishing uh, fishing boats being moored up and, and not able to go I, out I thought, again. I, I thought we had agreed a deal with Norway now. We've agreed, this is, makes it even worse, Ian, we agreed a trade deal with Norway that didn't give us access to the fishing waters. And the thing that's really angered local people is pre-EU, we had access to these fishing waters. During the EU, we had access to them because we had the European Union's quota to fish in that area because 
lots of people in your, there wasn't as much of a demand for cod and had and the, and the fish that you get out there and so post eu is the only time in which we've not had access to those waters and to really make really sort of put the sting in it uh, which was made it especially hard to swallow locally was liz trust tried to sell it as this is great we can import more fish from norway and there's more fish processing jobs in our area well, if you're a fisherman and your trade is is, is working, uh, you know, out at sea, and you're a proud fisherman from a long line of fishermen, and you have that heritage, you live in that area, and it forms part of your identity. Being told that, oh, don't worry, you can work in the fish processing factory instead, because look, we're making more jobs there, is hardly a fair trade-off. And it feels a bit like that with the Australian deal. I mean, the only reason we know much about it is because the Australian seems to have published the details. We haven't really seen the details. And if we talk back about Brexit and the taking back control, it's taking back control and giving it to who? Because it seems to be going directly to the government, certainly not to parliament, as we've seen this week with the contempt in which the government uh, held parliament by refusing to give any announcements to them and the rebuttal that we just saw from the speaker. But if we really want to give control back to more people and why wouldn't we? We should be having that uh, deal with Australia scrutinised, voted on, interrogated in Parliament and lots of these questions answered along the lines of, okay, so if this is going to impact farmers in our country, then what are we going to do to mitigate that? What are the changes that we, you know, as a constituency MP, these are the things your constituents are asking you, these are the questions you should be able to ask. But instead, we've got a poor deal to, you know, to increase jobs in fish processing, which is all very well. It's not as good as working on the boats to begin with, though, is it? And then we've got a deal with uh, Australia that potentially puts our food security as a nation at risk, because if we have our farmers suddenly uh, shut up shops, then that's going to have an impact there. So, you know, I kind of think, well, okay. it's better than nothing, but not much better. Please, Lily, better than nothing, but not much better. Well, I, for a moment, I was pleased that everybody was following Dominic's uh, point that it's tiresome to go over the old Brexit debates, then having all agreed that uh, two of our commentators did sort of go rather back over that sort of thing. Uh, one of the reasons the Brexit debate is tiresome to repeat is that a mistake both sides made during the Brexit debate was assuming that trade deals are what drives trade. Trade deals are useful, but they're much less important than people imagine. Uh, so she, the question is quite right. There won't be a huge growth of trade just because of this trade deal with Australia, but it's a good thing. Uh, she's wrong in supposing that our membership of the single market was a huge driver of trade. I was the Secretary of State who had to introduce the whole single market program. And uh, like everybody else, I thought it would have a wonderful boost to our export. And I made bullish speeches saying how Vastly, our exports would expand. 25 years later, they'd grown by less than half a percent a year, less than the growth of the GDP of the countries we'd signed that deal with. Meanwhile, of the 14 biggest countries we traded with outside uh, any trade deal uh, on WTO terms, our exports had grown by 78%. That doesn't mean to say you don't want trade deals. It means that what drives trade is producing goods and services and selling them to growing and prosperous markets. Australia is an important market in itself. It will, our trade will be eased by reduction in or the elimination of tariffs on cars and on whiskey and uh, things like that. But that's comparatively small beer. Of more importance is the fact that this is our entry route to the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade and whatever it is, TPTTP or TTPP, you know, I can never remember <laughs> how many T's and P's there are in the Pacific uh, Agreement, which is one of the biggest trade in blocks in the world uh, and fast growing. Now, even that won't be the solution to all our problems. The only solution to the trading prob trading or the only way to be sure to be prosperous is produce goods and services other people want to buy, get us and sell them, preferably aided by a competitive exchange rate. Have trade deals? Yes. Glad to see Liz Truss is uh, launching more trade deals. They'll all be modestly useful, but let's not imagine that our success comes from trade deals. It comes from making goods and services people want to buy. So to Claire's question, are we ever going to be able to financially recoup the money we've lost by leaving the EU? Um, what's your answer? We haven't lost money by leaving the EU. In the long run, we saved £10 billion a year, which was the net contribution we made. 
Uh, but the economists will say that our GDP has reduced by X percent each year because we're no longer members of the EU, so that has cost the economy. No, well, some would say that, but uh, I had long disputes with the uh, head of the economic uh, section of the Treasury, and he agreed that a lot of their forecasts and that were rubbish, and he went on, left the Treasury, and now works elsewhere. Um, but uh, no, the um, we haven't l cut off our trade to Europe. Europe is going to make things difficult for us for a while because their priority is not economic prosperity. It's making sure that other people don't follow our example and leave the European Union. And for that reason, there was never any prospect of them giving us a win-win deal. It had, from their point of view, to appear to be a win-lose deal. It had to appear that we were losing uh, something. But um, in the long run, they will come around and we will trade and prosper. In the meantime, we will continue to trade and prosper if our people get out and sell goods that they want. OK. Uh, Claire, very quickly, um, I, I imagine you're probably slightly unhappy about the answers you've had. Yeah, the, the, the answers, quite frankly, were pathetic. Um, I'm, I'm oh, not being dear. disrespectful. We very have generous not, of you, very generous. And, I, uh, and that's <laughs> not with regard to most, the majority of the panellists. That's primarily the, the um, uh, Tory MP. My son is based in Barcelona. There isn't one of them, but hey. <laughs> and the Europeans love British products. They go crazy. I, my, one, of my son, one of my son's friends owns a shop and sells nothing but British products. And it's all being bought by Spaniards. My question was, can we ever recoup the 200 billion we've lost by walking away from a market of 500 million? If the answer is no, Ian, then we're big enough and ugly well, enough and brave enough to take it on and chin. And no, there's no well, chance of that. We, we, but be honest all, we, with us. Tell us the truth. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you and tell you the truth. We haven't walked away from a market of 500 million people. We still trade with that market of 500 million people. So um, you're starting from the wrong premise almost. Well, I can't see how a trade... I mean, and this chap, is it Lord Lilly? Is that his yeah. name? He's saying that um, that it's we don't need trade deals. Before all this Brexit thing exploded, we were told the most important thing was trade deals. We never. This is the thing you hear on LBC no, so often. We've never been told the truth. We were told that we would leave the. Um, uh, yeah, but, but, but Claire, on, Claire with, with, with respect, if you say that we're broadcasting misinformation, you've just broadcast misinformation by saying that we're walking away from a market of 500 million. We're absolutely not. Um, Peter Lilly, you wanted to come back on Claire there. Yes, I mean, I said what I'm saying now during the course of the debate, and it's quite high profile. I was a former trade minister, and it was widely reported, and certainly in every debate that I attended, and I used to do two a day during the referendum campaign, I would say, don't exaggerate the importance of trade deals. Um, they're useful, better to have them and not. But as you say, we haven't walked away from the EU market, and it's highly contentious to say we've lost this mythical £200 billion. OK, well, uh, Claire, thank you very much for that. Stand by your beds, because in a couple of minutes, we have a question from Sean in concert. It's coming up to 8.45. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. His address at the funeral of his sister still makes the spine tingle. But of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. Since then, he's also responded to the disgraceful job sprung on his sister by the BBC. Diana did lose trust in really key people. When she died, she was without any form of real protection. Now, Charles Spencer is a best-selling historical author, and he joins me, Nick Ferrari, Thursday morning from 7. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Listen live on Global Player. LBC.
question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 8.47 on LBC. You're listening to Cross Question or watching Cross Question. We have Jason Cowley, Peter Lilly, Emma Hardy and Dominic Samuels with us. Uh, let's go to Sean in concert for the next question. Sean, fire away. Hello, Hi. Ian. How, hello, Palin, panel. Uh, can you tell me, has this government really lost the plot now because of this social distancing, right? You had a barbecue for Tories, right? And all the, the G7, right? You had the cricket, you had the football... And now you had Royal Ascot, right? Drinking champagne, no social distancing. Why is people getting penalised at weddings and funerals for having no social distancing? That's it's, a, a very joke, fa- man. It, it's getting beyond a joke, this. This government is wrong the twist. I mean, th- this is in an interesting one, isn't it? Because, of course, it was also announced that there's going to be a full attendance at the finals of Wimbledon this year. And you think, well, hang on a minute, how can that possibly be the case when you have at Wembley 20,000 people, all social distancing, you can't possibly social distance on the centre court at Wimbledon if you have a full uh, allocation of people. That, there are many inconsistencies here, aren't there, Jason Cowley? Well, there certainly are inconsistencies, which is why our, our friend from the northeast was so agitated. He's, he's, he, he said the government's round a twist. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite say that, but it's, it is the inconsistencies here, which I think is are upsetting people and irritating people. Particularly, you know, one of, one of John Boris Johnson's skills, you could say, his failures is is to overpromise, um, and then he invariably has to let people down. I mean, this this whole this whole talk about Freedom Day when we would be liberated from lockdown. And then inevitably, the, fail- the government's own failures to control um, incoming flights from India during April has resulted in this, this spread of the Delta variant, which originated in India, in a very, very disturbing spread. You know, it would have come to the UK anyway, but what happened in April was accelerated its arrival and its spread, which is then, as it has had, had a con- consequence, because Johnson also listens to the scientists and the medics around him who are advising him, and he's had to reverse once again. And it's upset people, and they they see inconsistencies everywhere. I didn't know about Santa Claude at Wimbledon. You, so, you can't socially distance there unless you're in the royal box here, and where no doubt you will be. Um, <laughs> when we, Charles when we would be a the, fine when, thing. <laughs> well, they, I hope they're listening to this. They'll invite you. 20,000 people at Wim, Wimbledon. People can't, um, limited number of people at uh, funerals and other social occasions. I do think people are getting confused, they're getting frustrated, and they're upset. The, the times I've been to Wimbledon, I used to sleep on the pavement outside, I'll have you know. Um, Emma Hardy. Yeah, don't worry, that's going to change this year, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I agree. It is the inconsistency of message and, and just so frustrating. I think yeah, the overwhelming feeling I get from people, certainly up here in Hull, is that people are fed up. We've had enough now. This has been going on, you know, for a really long time. They were promised there would be these freedoms on the 21st of June and it's been pulled away at the last minute. As Jason said, after being built up and built up and built up, to have that taken away is is such a kick in the teeth. And and I've been hearing from uh, a local guy who's a a DJ bloke who's who's getting involved unbelievably in sort of turning around a local shopping centre and putting a club into the basement of a shopping centre in Hull, which you can definitely come to, Ian, when we have... uh, we have that night up here but he was saying to me how upset he's been with the nighttime industry and the nightclubbing industry we've had no support and again it's that inconsistency and you can see why he's so angry yes you can go to center court and you can watch tennis now more people can go uh to weddings you can go to um you, you know watching matches but you can't go to a nightclub and have a dance on an evening because oh. that's inconsistent with the rules and, and it does feel that the government are picking and choosing if i'm being honest the, the the sort of leisure pursuits that maybe they enjoy more than others so perhaps we need to perish the thought oh, Emma, what, the, what a terrible thing to say <laughs> we need to get the government clubbing that's what we need to do and then maybe they'll be interested oh in the nighttime economy um but michael gove not. in ibiza with his shirt off that's what you want isn't it in a, well, as I've just said, in a basement club at a shopping centre in Hull, that's where they all need to be. Um, but this this frustration and this anger, I think, has been made worse by the delay 
with the borders. And, and the, the frustrating thing is, is that nobody in this case, no one can accuse the Labour Party of not having mentioned this. I think we've mentioned it repeatedly from January in February. And in fact, we produced today a dossier of all the number of times we've said, close the borders, sort out quarantine, close the borders, sort out quarantine. Okay. Even, you know, went there and made the point and did a video on it. So it's not they weren't told. They just chose not to listen to it. For, and I honestly don't understand why. I'm going to ask for brief answers from Peter and Dominic because then we can squeeze in another question. Um, Peter first. Well, I, I agree with Emma. And it's wonderful to know that she's going to rebel about against her front bench as I should probably rebel, rebel about mine. The only reason for this delay is for more people to have their second jab. Uh, there's absolutely no reason for preventing the 30 million people who already had their second jab or are too young to have to worry about the potentially fatal effects of COVID because it won't do them serious and lasting harm, uh, is, is to allow, the, so the only, there's no justification for stopping them getting out and enjoying themselves. Uh, and it's not just the inconsistencies, it's the, there is no reason for doing this. They should just say to the 30 million people, or to the 10 million people who've had their first jab and not the second, you've got a lot of protection from your first jab if you want to get absolutely the maximum protection. Be very cautious for the next four weeks or so until you've had your second jab. Meanwhile, everybody else go out and enjoy themselves and carry on. We've got to get back to relying on people's personal responsibility common sense and not trying to micromanage every aspect of their lives. Okay, D Dominic? I think there will be endless inconsistencies because when you exert so much control over people's lives, it's very likely that those in power um, won't stick to the rules they put in place. Um, and I think, you know, with the delay, there are a lot of questions around it that don't make sense to me. First being that um, a lot of the data that this was based upon was, quite frankly, the predictions were just incorrect. I mean, the Telegraph um, did an article recently looking deeper at the figures. Um, and according to the 9th of June model done by Warwick, they predicted around this time that hospital admissions would be 2,257. The actual number is 1,501. Um, if you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine and the protection that it gives you... Um, against the, the Delta variant, it's 71% and then 92% for the second dose. Um, and I could go on forever, but I know this has to be short, but what I'm trying to say is that the data this, this was based on was they out of date and were really over predicted, even discounting the arrival of a new variant. So this decision to me just really does not make sense. It just seems like um, an inconsistency in itself. And also once we get into autumn and winter territory, Who's to say that there won't be another cry for restrictions once we're in that territory when cases will inevitably rise again? I think we need to learn to live with the virus. We're in a really good place now where it's starting to, be, to become endemic. Eight in ten adults um, in the UK have antibodies. Let's move on. OK. Uh, Sean, I'm going to move on because I think we know what you think, judging from the way you put your question. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Judith in Thrapston has asked a question on a text. The Guardian is reporting that vaccines are set to be made compulsory for care home staff. Is this fair or right? Now, we've got four minutes, so that's 60 seconds each. Emma Hardy, go. I'm not convinced by by making it compulsory. I mean, I've had the vaccine, I support the vaccine, I'd encourage everybody to go and have the vaccine, but I think um, forcing people, I don't think is the best way to go on this. I would much prefer to encourage, to persuade, to convince, to show the evidence to, you know, all of these measures before we go down making something uh, compulsory, mm -hmm. a mandatory part of, of their job would be the way I'd do it admirably brief which gives jason a few more seconds yes um persuade could cajole encourage um people to have the vaccine i don't think we can force them through the law to do so it might violate religious beliefs it might violate um um certain convictions i i I'm, i have no idea why you why you wouldn't listen to the scientists and to be vaccinated Actually, I have ideas, but I, I, I understand why some people wouldn't. Um, but you can't, you can't force people to be vaccinated. No. Do, do you think, though, that maybe care home owners should be allowed to say, "Well, if you don't have a vaccine, you ain't working for me"? That's a different question, and um, I'd need to think more about it than a 10, 10 second answer. But yeah, that may be a consequence of refusing the vaccine. 
Dominique? Um, I'm obviously of the belief that the individual is sovereign and nobody should be forced to undergo um, a medical procedure that they don't want. There are various reasons why people might not want to get the vaccine and some of the concerns um, around the vaccine, I don't believe are just complete conspiracy theories. Just looking at some of the countries that have particular concerns about AstraZeneca, for example. Um, I think the role of the, the whole thing about saying that, well, you can't work for me if you don't do this. I disagree with that because that in itself is coercing people to do something that you want to do that you want them to do i don't well, think yeah, but there is a reason for it isn't there, there is a reason and and the yeah. reason is because you're more likely to infect the people that are paying a thousand pounds a week to be cared for yeah but of course but even then you know the vaccine in itself isn't 100 percent effective when it comes to transmission anyway i mean sage said but the people that would be hospitalized would actually be double dose because of their own in immunization failures they'd be more at risk to that than they would an unvaccinated person and that's scientists that have actually said that so this idea that we should start barring people from society because they don't want to undergo a certain medical procedure, I think it's a, it's a completely immoral um, injustice. Uh, have you had the vaccine? Are you going to have the vaccine? Um, I think that, you know, that's my personal information. That's my personal choice. The reason I'm saying that is not because... You're sounding like I Jeremy Corbyn now. <laughs> no, it it's not because I actually agree with his sentiment. It's not because I'm an anti-vax, pro-vax, whatever. Um, I've actually been vaccinated before. The reason is, is I'm not feeding into this culture of people trying to validate their opinion by saying they've been vaccinated, which then leads to demonising people who haven't. I'm just not engaging in it. Peter? Uh, the government shouldn't require people to have the vaccine in order to work in certain places, but it's perfectly reasonable for the owner or manager of a uh, care home to say, uh, if you want to work here, then you've got to have the vaccine uh, because I want to offer that level of security to the people who come in here. Uh, and it will be up to people to make their choice where they work uh, in those circumstances. But, uh, you know, it's, it's they have a freedom, the owners and managers of those homes and the people resident in them, just as other people do. But it's not what we've got to get away from is the idea that the government has to lay down whether people can and cannot do things the whole time. It's taken on huge powers. It's time it gave them back. I rather wish we'd come to this question a bit earlier because I think that it's actually quite an interesting ethical and moral question here rather than just a political one. Uh, maybe we should have a few more ethical questions on feature editions of Cross Question. Uh, tomorrow, let me tell you, we have the head of Liberty, Gracie May Bradley with us, Charlie Mullins from Pimlico Plumbers, Angus McNeil, the SNP MP, and the former Conservative Health Minister, Edwina Curry. So that should be a bit of a spicy one. Thank you all four of you for joining us this evening. Jason Cowley, Peter Lilly, Emma Hardy and Dominic Samuels look forward to welcoming you back into the studio it won't be quite as quickly as we thought but there we go you're listening to lbc i'm ian dale it's nine o'clock on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this is lbc from Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the Commissioner of the Met Police, Dame Cressida Dick, has apologised for failings in an unsolved murder case after an